I like to start my lectures on the history of mathematics and science with this quotation from uh, the great Sir Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist of all time. And I left out the initial part of the quotation here for as a little challenge. So uh, if we read the second part of the, of the quote, let's try to figure out what goes in the initial blank here. So Newton is saying this thing, whatever uh, uh, it is that I have left out, it is, according to Newton, so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. So um, evidently this thing that goes in the black, whatever it is, it must be something like the stupidest thing you ever heard. Newton thinks it is uh, a ridiculous uh, theory. So uh, what could it be that he's talking about, do you think? You're just like, well, Newton, he's working here. This is the late uh, 17th century. And Newton is writing this stuff as kind of some scientific revolution has made great strides. Could it be that uh, what he's referring to are the kinds of things that w were rejected in the scientific revolution, very various pseudo-scientific uh, kind of mysticism and such that was I I previously believed, like astrology, alchemy, witchcraft and magic and fairy tales, you know, stuff like that. Is th those kinds of things that he, uh, something like that, that he's rejecting here in this, uh, in this passage maybe, or uh, could it be something about the uh, conflict between science and religion? Supposedly, was also a major theme of this era, you know, uh, according to some. And uh, maybe he's, uh, what he's rejecting here is something like a literal interpretation of the Bible, maybe. Or, you know, there are passages that in the Bible that imply that the Earth is uh, stationary at the center of the solar system and these kinds of things, which maybe there's something like that that he's trying to reject. Well, uh, those are all viable guesses that would make sense. From a modern point of view, you could uh, those are perhaps the the, the first uh, things that would come into into our minds as as plausible uh, objects that Newton might attack in this kind of uh, phraseology. Well, uh, let's look then at what in fact Newton is talking about. So I'm going to show you the initial part of the quotation over here. And so what Newton is saying is this great uh, absurdity that he's rejecting is that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else. Well, in other words, uh, Newton's own theory of gravity, exactly as is taught today to every high school student. It's just uh, th that that's exactly what gravity means, that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else. So it's just uh, today we just write this down as a formula, you know, oh, it's uh, the force is inversely proportional to the distance square, blah. it's just a fact. This is something we accept people to swallow unconditionally uh, as uh, just a plain scientific fact. Whereas Newton himself, the very discoverer of this theory, calls it uh, so great an absurdity that no one can believe it. So th uh, isn't he right? In fact, isn't gravity the craziest thing you ever heard? Uh, why do we believe uh, in, in, in this absurd theory anyway? You know, uh, for example, uh, if I move my hand a little bit here, whoops, then I also move the moon and I move the planet Saturn and so on. Th uh, this is just a fact of uh, Newtonian uh, gravitational theory that any body with a certain mass impacts uh, any other uh, body with a certain mass uh, with a certain force. Okay, a very small force, nevertheless it's there. And isn't that uh, very... Uh, uh, indeed, very absurd, L just like Newton says, isn't it though? Isn't it worse than any of those uh, pseudo-scientific theories that we were speculating that maybe Newton were rejected? Like witchcraft or some kind of superstition and astrology and this and that. Isn't this a notion that I can move uh, the planet Saturn by just swiping my hand? Isn't that as absurd as any of those uh, pseudo-scientific things that one could think of? I would say so. So, well... Um, let us not, uh, you know, when people are ignorant of history, they forget these kinds of, these kinds of things. So that's uh, worthwhile to study. So I summarized it like this, that education is a form, is indoctrination, you might say. And uh, what we teach today to our school kids is what Isaac Newton, the very creator of that very theory, which we accept people nowadays to just uh, accept as an article of faith. That 
that very creator Isaac Newton said himself that no man who has some philosophical matters or competent faculty of thinking can ever believe this nonsense and yet we ask our students to do precisely that to believe it and not not to accept it uh, despite it being absurd but rather just to accept it as a s simple plain uh, you know uh, common sense science as if it were just some some kind of natural discovery as opposed to a uh, far-fetched theory of uh, comparable absurdity to witchcraft and fairy tales, as it in fact is, and as in fact Newton himself said. So, well, uh, let us all uh, uh, keep keep that in mind, I, I would say. So, of course, uh, Newton, I mean, he's not saying that we should throw away gravity altogether, you know, I mean, it is this great discovery, and he did want to preserve, you know, gravity is a great... Uh, an interesting discovery obviously and he didn't want to discard it that's not his point with this uh, passage calling it absurd but he here's uh, like he says over here that the gravity it's a law of nature the truth appearing to us by phenomena that is to say uh, gravity it it works you know you can compute predict and it just works so in that sense obviously we have to keep the gravity because it's a great uh, it's a great discovery in that sense but also, though, uh, he continues, uh, the causes be not yet discovered, uh, the causes of gravity. We don't know why it's, it's like that way. That's not yet discovered, said Newton. Uh, and in fact, it's not yet discovered today either. So we're still left with this. Uh, you know, Newton was more optimistic, perhaps, that one could discover some kind of cause. Well, why is it gravity? Maybe there is some invisible substance somehow or other that we are not aware of that, uh, that explains it. But uh, though there has been no uh, such uh, progress in, in science as people once hoped. And so, like Newton says here in the last line, uh, therefore you might say that causes of gravity are, are occult. So this is Newton's defense of gravity, you know, saying that, you know, the gravity is it's pretty good. It's only partly occult, as uh, the way that he uh, justifies it. So... Maybe, you know, you don't see that uh, too often, perhaps people defending modern physics textbooks are saying that, yeah, well, it's occult, but only in some in some parts it's nevertheless useful despite being a little bit occult, you know. So that's uh, certainly, a, 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 I would say, a, a different way of looking at things than the one we present to our school children today. Uh, food for thought, look at the... Uh, Theory of the tides. That's an interesting uh, case, uh, case in point illustration of the theory of gravity. So, uh, people have known for a long time that the tides, the tidal waters, the ebb and flow of the sea, the rising and uh, lowering of the sea levels at the in, in coastal areas and so on, is coordinated with the moon. If you lived by the coast, you have seen these kinds of tables where it says if it's full moon, it's gonna the tides will occur in such and such times, and if it's half moon, you know this and that. So uh, people have known for thousands of years that I evidently the ebb and flow of the sea are associated with the phases of the moon. It's just a, a crude uh, correlation uh, that anyone can observe. But uh, uh, why though? Why should it be uh, like that? How can the moon influence the water? Or why should the water obey the moon? What does the water care what the moon is doing? Why should it, you know? So I I that's a, a peculiar a phenomenon of nature, which Newton, in the Principia, uh, proves, using his theory of gravity, that just uh, I in this this proposition over here, that the flux and reflux of the sea arise from the actions of the sun and moon, and primarily the moon, gravitational pull of the moon, is the uh, driving force of that. Uh, oh, this just follows from Newtonian gravity, that in fact the gravitational pull of the moon I is what is the the main cause of the uh, of the tides. So that's just, uh, something that Newton proves. Well, uh, to indicate how absurd this is, we may look at what Galileo thought. This is Galileo just a generation before Newton, not long before, 50 years before. Uh, he uh, also w obviously was aware of this fact that there is a correlation between the tides and the moon. And he was aware also that some people had various... Uh, kind of pseudo-mysticism kinds of theories about how the moon was uh, a 
you know, kind of quasi-divine or something like that and was somehow influencing, controlling the, uh, the waters. And this Galileo absolutely rejects and says, look, uh, this is kind of ridiculous, you know, superstition and, uh, and mysticism that this is the kind of nonsense that we are rejecting here in scientific revolution. We no longer believe this kind of uh, hocus pocus. The idea that the moon could somehow influence the water how is that supposed to, you know, it, it's not like it has a long string or anything that it can pull and make the water move. And, you know, nowhere else in our everyday experience do we have this, uh, any indication that you can move uh, hugely massive objects like huge uh, oceans or anything through just, uh, yeah, without pushing or pulling, without having a piece of string or without having a, you know, lever or anything like that. So uh, it it's just uh, anti-scientific, uh, bogus to think that the moon can influence the the waters like that, according to to Galileo. And here, we, uh, let me show you his actual quotation over here. And he gives a thought experiment with a bowl. Uh, you you put take a bowl of water like this or a tub of water, and you you uh, think of that as a model of uh, the oceans. Uh, of the earth and you ask yourself how could I make uh, produce tides in my bowl of water over here could I you know sit thousands of miles away and kind of think or or cast a spell or anything like that and try to make the water move like the moon apparently is doing no of course not that's ridiculous the only way you're gonna make the water move is by actually grabbing the bowl and shaking it around uh, that's what Galileo says here in this uh, in this quotation so uh, therefore, uh, you know, th th so what Galileo is saying is that th th these, uh, you have to discard this kind of hocus pocus and you should just apply uh, simple common sense stuff that you yourself can try out. It's like the experimental scientific method, you know. It's like, well, I, I have it here in my hands, I can shake the ball around and this is the only way I can make the thing move. So therefore, the theory of the tides is uh, also... Uh, caused by these kinds of effects. So it's the motion of the Earth that causes the, the tides, according to Galileo. But, of course, we now know he's wrong. It is the Moon. It is that crazy hocus-pocus pseudo-scientific mysticism theory that the Moon somehow, by an act of quasi-magic, makes the water move. This thing, which Galileo rejected as the greatest, uh, you know, the, as, as the kind of backward thinking that we have discarded in scientific revolution. It was actually right. And Galileo is actually wrong. The great scientific method approach of Galileo of, of uh, using an actual uh, model, this little bowl and so on, turned out to be the wrong way to think about it. And uh, the, in fact, the mysticism approach uh, had the right answer after all. It turned out uh, in, the, in the end with uh, Newtonian gravity not long after Galileo. So you know, uh, there are enough Galileos of today, don't you think? People who advocate on, on a, in the name of science, they say, oh, you know, this is, oh, this is ridiculous, this is ridiculous. Science so shows that, uh, that you're wrong about this and that and the other thing. And maybe these people need to learn to be a little more humble because, you know, Galileo had an excellent case here. You, if you didn't know about Newtonian gravity, if you didn't know the right answer, you know, you'd think that Galileo's argument is really pretty solid that uh, uh, really the only way you can make ties in a cup of water is by shaking it about and not by the mysterious influence by somebody that is thousands of miles away. So uh, it's a very compelling uh, argument that, that Galileo made and uh, you would be tempted to, to, to believe him really. But history shows, teaches us a lesson of humility that we need to uh, learn to be more open-minded uh, sometimes and not think that we have all the all the answers so food for thought this is my uh, introductory lecture in my series on the history of mathematics and science and here then I want to conclude uh, the general lessons about history that we can learn from this these episodes here so I say here uh, that the uh, s the study of history then is useful medicine against indoctrination and close-mindedness like the indoctrination of the Newtonian textbook uh, 
that we feed to high school kids today you know you don't want to be on your guard against that uh, the, the, the the dogmatic nature of those uh, those kinds of teachings is something that history can make you more aware of and also the close mindedness in the manner of galileo for example that uh, you th you uh, you can end up thinking that you have all the answers if you're not uh, on your uh, on your guard sometimes and and history is valuable it helps us think uh, through the perspective of other people you know you uh, in history people were different than us today diversity of thought is something that can help us uh, discard some of our prejudices and it's valuable to study history for this reason so those are some of the main reasons why i would encourage you to study history and that is the spirit in which i shall uh, teach uh, history myself